my name is Michelle Sanders from Memphis. Um, I have a couple of different positions at my campus, but um, if any of you attended my session yesterday, I'm the founder and the director of the Harmony Ingenuity Biomedical Sciences Academy. That is a mouthful. We just call it HIVSA. Okay. H-I-B-S-A. Um, in addition to that, I am also the campus STEM coordinator. So part of my job is pretty much enforcing and supporting the T-STEM blueprint on campus. And part of that is setting up this advisory board. So um, before we start, what I do want to say is that these sessions, um, that these conference sessions that you're attending actually do work. I learned how to do this last year from the T-STEM conference. There was a guy from another school and he presented about how to do this and he gave me his packet and I used his packet to create all my documents. <laughs> and so that's why I said it's, it's kind of like a pay it forward. He gave it to me, so now I'm giving it to you guys. And maybe next uh, year one of you will be at the conference presenting and you'll be giving it to someone else. So um, in terms of the T-STEM requirements, this is probably one of the most difficult ones to do because you have to step outside of your school and actually talk to people and put yourself up for rejection. And that is the hardest thing in the world is that rejection. And I'll talk about that a little bit about, you know, the rejection, is it worth it? Did everyone get one of the packets? I know we had a few people come in. They're right here. <clears throat> okay, so from requirement to reality, how to set up a T-STEM advisory board. Um, with all of my presentations, I actually like to start off with expectations. What would you like to know? I don't want anyone to go home disappointed. I want to make sure that I answer as many questions as possible. And we all know that typically we save questions until the end, but going into this, I want to know if there's an appropriate place where I need to insert some extra information that I didn't already plan for. So expectations versus actual is the difference between a wow and a, ugh, she just wasted 50 minutes of my time. So what would you all like to know from this presentation? I want to know. Oh, I was like, I don't want to know anything. <laughs> I want to know um, how to reach out. Like, I can understand how to reach out to parents who are in industry and can be partners, but to those who are just completely detached from campus, mm -hmm. um, and then also how to. This might seem silly, but how to physically get your students to those locations if they're not driving or their parents don't seem very willing to get them to where they need to be. Any other want to knows? Yeah. yeah, I guess uh, I want to know more about the incentives on the business side of things. What's their incentive as well as the universities? Absolutely. Okay. And that's actually a lot easier. I'll tell you about that, though. Any other want to knows? All right. So I imagine we'll probably have some pop up as we're going along. If you have a question, please just ask me. It's very interactive. I, you know, I don't want to stand up here like a dictator and like, you know, you be quiet and listen and then there's time for questions later. Just if you have a question, just, you don't even have to raise your hand, just ask me, okay? <clears throat> All right, so the benchmark, the TSIM blueprint benchmark that we're addressing here is 1.2C, which is the school has to develop and demonstrate support from an advisory board consisting of representatives from the academy, the school board, the district, the community, higher education, and STEM businesses to support and guide facility requirements, resource acquisition, curriculum development, internships, externships, and student community outreach to ensure a successful 6th through 20th STEM, academy, STEM academic and career pipeline. There, it's a quote the guy who presented last year, there is wisdom in this. They're telling you exactly what they want you to do. They're telling you who they want you to recruit. They're telling you who should be on your advisory board and what they're supposed to do. Now, that part we already knew. The part that's difficult is how do we do it, right? So, step one is actually going to be targeting your members, and that's actually addressing your question. When you think about um, your industry officials, what kind of industry officials do you want to target? For my campus, we are the District Medical Academy. So that question was easy for us. It was, we want those healthcare officials. <laughs> For your campuses, some of you may be engineering specific. There was one uh, lady spoke to me about one campus yesterday that actually had four different pathways. So you want representatives <coughs> from each of those pathways. Think about what pathways your school offers. Think about what careers your students are interested in. Those are usually going to be good areas to start. Our TSM Blueprint requires us to send out a survey to our to actually survey our students. I would just add in an extra question on that survey. What do you think you're interested in doing? 
they're gonna, your students are going to tell you who, what they're interested in doing and which industry officials you need to be targeting for those students. Most, in terms of um, general one students say, engineering and healthcare are probably going to be two big ones. Um, you might get a few others thrown in there. For example, depending on your demographic, you may have students who want to go into welding, which means you might want to look at that. Um, it really just depends on what, what's in your area, who's around you, what are your students interested in. What's the makeup of your school? Where's your school located? Our school is right next to the medical center in Houston, Texas. So that was another reason why we're the district medical academy. So thinking of that, what's the direction that your school is headed in? We're transitioning to becoming. We are the, we're labeled as the district medical academy, but we're transitioning to fully taking on that title. That's guiding what we want to do. We need the community to represent the community aspect of going into that, into that direction. Who's in your area? There may be a business right down the street. In our case, there was a business right down the street, a vet clinic right down the street. So, um, and then also PTO representatives. You do want to make sure you have parents sitting on the board. You don't want to have too many parents because you don't want to turn this into another PTO. What we, in our bylaws, which I believe you all have a copy of, I actually stated that it, this uh, board should be 80% industry officials. We have very few parents, and when we chose parents, we specifically selected parent. We actually talked with the PTO and said, can you send one or two representatives out to the board meeting? So you want to make sure parents are on the board, but you don't want to turn it into another PTO. You have a PTO. You want this to be your advisory board, so pick a representative from the PTO. <clears throat> so what worked for us? Um, we picked up medical professionals. We looked at medical institutes in the area, Pima Medical Institute, Texas Health Institute. So we were looking at some of those institutes of higher education. We looked at support groups. We were looking at the American Heart Association. We were looking at the American Diabetes Association. We literally just did a Google search and looked for everyone that was in our area. And that's actually what I'm showing you right there. I just looked up doctor's <coughs> office and I typed in our zip code and we started tracking them. We put the office name, we put down their number, we got their contact information. This does take a lot of time. So it's not a one person job. There were like three of us in my office and we had yellow pages out and white pages out and we were just looking around for all of these, these professionals. Okay? Um, in terms of awareness organizations, like you said, sometimes they say yes. They don't get a lot of schools asking them. So when we were thinking about healthcare, we said okay, Heart Association we want, Diabetes Association we want. Um, let's look at some of the other ones, the Alzheimer's Association. I was in my car driving and I saw a billboard for the Alzheimer's Association and I you know, had my husband write down the number and I just, okay, we're gonna call them and see if they're interested. Um, T-STEM personnel, our T-STEM coach sits on our advisory board, um, which I know I didn't really know if they could do that or not, but I was like, the worst thing she can say is no. So, and I asked her and they were like, yeah, that's fine. We'll sit on your advisory board. So our TSIP coach sits on our advisory board. For institutes of higher education, we have Prairie View A&M University sitting on our uh, advisory board. There is a reason they're sitting there. It's because they're the only college with an undergraduate medical academy, which is the college component of what we do. So we specifically target Prairie View. How did we get them? Well, well first I'll show you. This, uh, this is actually the spreadsheet I created in Google Docs. As you can see, I tracked every facility their mailing address, their phone number, their website. When I called them, um, what was their response? Did they say yes? Did they say no? Did I leave a voicemail? Who did I speak to? What was their emailing address? Sometimes you get a voicemail and you don't speak to anyone. So you need to make a note. I need to call back later. So what are some tips? When you call these offices, don't ask for the doctors. Ask for the office manager. Many of us up in, well actually all of us in here work in education. And you all as working in education, I picked up that the principal runs the school, but who really runs the school on an office reception, <coughs> same thing is true for them. Don't ask for the doctor. Ask for the office manager. That's, the, that's your way that you get to the doctor. Because they're going to be the ones that are going to pass the message along. And in a lot of cases, the doctor's not available. And if they are available, they're thinking about you know something else and they're not really listening to what you're saying. Talk to the office manager. Leave a message for the office manager. They're the ones that are going to let the doctor know. 
and they they run the whole office. Mm. So, um, be willing to leave messages. That was a little daunting. Thank you. That was a little daunting for me at first because I was like, well, what if they don't call back? But when I let when I called the office manager and they said, hey, do you want to leave a message? The doctor's not available. When I left messages, nine times out of ten, I got to call back from somebody. Okay? And if you don't, then you call them again and leave another message. It could be they just forgot. Okay? So be willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Just because they call you back doesn't mean that they're ignoring you. It, it may mean they actually forgot. Okay? Um, be prepared to give information about your school. A little comical story. I was not expecting that question. <laughs> uh, I know it seems a little ironic, but... I got on the phone with this doctor. She's like, yeah, so tell me information about your school. And I'm like, uh, wow. <laughs> so I just kind of had to just go ahead and tell her what I knew, which actually turned out to be really good. But I made sure that I wrote that information down for next time so I could just have something already ready. This is our school. This is how long we've been open. These are the grades that we serve. You, they're going to ask you about your school. And it's better to be prepared than to not be prepared. Be flexible. Ask the office to send anyone. You don't have to say, we, when we have this breakfast, we want you to send the doctor. Say, if the doctor's unavailable, can you send anyone from your office? Can you send a nurse? Can you send the office manager? That gives them a little bit more flexibility and it lets them know, hey, we just want someone from your office. It does not have to be this doctor. Um, usually the doctor can't come sometimes, but if you, make, if you let them know that you're flexible enough, they will send someone to represent you. Use your existing partnerships. Our school nurse is a, our school nurse actually is a doctor. Weird. But our school nurse actually is a doctor. And because she's a doctor, she actually has all of these connections with existing healthcare facilities in the area. So she would bring them to our school to do like a dental screenings for the students. And when she brought them, she would just introduce them to me and I would say, hey, we're building up our advisory board. Would you like to come out? And yeah, we already know about your school, so we have no problem coming out. Um, the other thing is go to their events. The way we got Prairie View, they have an event every January and to, uh, as a fundraiser for their undergraduate medical academy. We brought 50 kids to their event and just by chance the associate director of the UMA just happened to sit next to me. And when she sat next to me we were talking and I said, hey, we're building up our advisory board. Would you like to come and join us? And she's like, yeah. I've been trying to get involved with Harmony Public Schools for a while. And I just never knew which one to target. And I was like, yes, yeah, you want to target us. We're the, we're the District Medical Academy. So anytime that you find an organization is having an awareness event, go out with your students. That's the way you get them. If you show them support, they will show you support. Okay? And to answer your question, Jody, that's kind of what's in it for them. They see a potential members partnership there where they're like, hey, they're always going to bring 50 students with them when we have our events. So we can send one person to their events. Right. So that's kind of how that works with that. Any questions so far about this? Step two, you want to send out a notice. Um, usually this is going to happen at the same time that you're on the phone with them. What I usually did first was, um, and which way you do this kind of depends, but I actually sent out the notice <coughs> first to their mailing address and then I called them. <laughs> And hey, did you receive the notice that we sent out? Um, in a lot of cases, they've, they've seen the notice, but they didn't know what it was, so they kind of set it aside. Usually, you want to try to call them before the notice ever gets there, so that they're looking for it when it gets there. Or in the case that they're not interested, they're too busy, then you don't have to worry about it again, you're fine, but you still send it to them. Um, you actually have a copy of this. That's the first page in that packet. That was the notice I sent out to them. I just introduced a little bit about our school, we extend a warm greeting to you as a local Houston healthcare or business institution. We are a public charter school academy that serves underprivileged youth and prepares them for career in STEM fields, especially healthcare professions. As a school, we are seeking to build alliances within our community to better prepare the youth within our school to be successful, productive citizens. Therefore, we are asking your organization to consider becoming our partner in education. I didn't want to use the word advisory board. Because I always feel when you say advisory board, they're like, oh, that's a big time commitment. If I say partner in education, they're like, hmm, I don't know what she wants from me. And also with this partner in education, it can fit under so many umbrellas. We use partner education to describe all of our partners, but only some of them are advisory board members. Others fall into the guest speaker unit. They can't commit to the advisory board, but they will give us guest speakers. They're still our partners in education. 
<laughs> Others um, assist with fundraising. They can't commit to the advisory board, but they are willing to give us $1,000. That's still a partner in education. So you can use that umbrella to describe all of your organizations and just have different categories for you. But I initially chose this term just because I felt advisory board tends to have a bad connotation to it sometimes. And you're a partner in education. You're helping us educate these kids. And, you know, who wouldn't want to be a partner, right? So um, the partner in education program is an integral component in the educational experience of HS Ingenuity students and of our success as a school. By bringing together the business community and tapping into their diverse resources, our campus is afforded much needed support by our students' education. Furthermore, it brings a better understanding of public charter schools by creating a climate of mutual involvement and interaction between our business partners and our community schools. The last paragraph is just telling them when and where we're having the meeting. Okay? So like I said before, please feel free to use this. It's, you can just change the school name if you want to, that's fine. <laughs> but you do want to try to personalize it a little bit more to your school. Um, in a lot of cases, they may not even know your school's there. Our school, if you've ever seen our school, our school used to be a um, medical research lab, so it looks like a medical research lab. And so when we called these doctors, they were like, I didn't even know there was a school there. We were like, yeah, we're here, we're here. So yeah, just make sure that you tell them a little bit of information about your school. You personalize a little bit to your school. Tell them what your school specializes in. Even though you can send this in mail form, when you talk with the doctors, some of them are going to prefer that you email it to them. Um, and that's fine too. I do recommend having an electronic copy because they'll tell you, if you mail it to me, it'll get lost. If you email it to me, I'll remember. So yeah, they'll just want you to email it to them and that's fine too. So tips. The potential member usually requests one method or another. Okay? They'll tell you snail mail or email. I recommend already having it sent out in the mail by the time you call them. So you can say, well, we already sent one to you. You can just expect it. Or if you, you, know, you don't want to seem creepy, don't tell them you sent it to them already. Mm -hmm. Just say, yeah, you can expect it in like, you know, tomorrow. And so they'll think, oh, they, they like express mailed it to me. And you're like, no, not really. I sent it out a week ago. But whatever, you know. So, um, and also send a follow-up reminder. They, they're busy. They may forget. So about a week before the meeting, you want to send an email to them, and they will give you their email address. Or call them and say, hey, this is just a reminder that this thing is next week. They will appreciate that because sometimes they do forget. At the latest, I would do it three days before. So a week to three days before. If you get any closer than that to the actual date, you run the risk of them already being double booked and they may not be able to make it. But if you do run into a case where they say, hey, something came up, I can't make it anymore. Hey, well, can you send someone else? Can you send a nurse? Can you send your office manager? Um, we just really need a representative from your, your uh, office. It doesn't necessarily have to be you, just someone that can bring back the information. Okay, that's fine. Um, step three, the event day. I always recommend doing breakfast, um, particularly because these doctors are going to prefer, you may not be targeting doctors, but all industry <coughs> officials are going to prefer to want to stop at your school on their way into the office than have to leave the office when they're already there. They're in, in all of our advisory board meetings, they do not, they only like mornings. They really don't like afternoons. It's because it's difficult. Once they're at school, I mean, once they're at their office, it's difficult for them to pull away. It's the same thing with us as teachers. Once we're there, you know, 50 million crises can happen in one day, and you're like, I can't leave now. Yeah. Little Johnny fell in his head. You know, I'm here, you know. So it's the same thing with them. Um, also, breakfast is actually really cheap to provide to people. So if you're working on a budget, breakfast is great. Um, we just send out, um, we just, if your school has an account with Sam's Club, we just get fruit, bagels, um, yogurt. One day we had cereal. I didn't order that. I don't know how that happened, but we had cereal one day and they actually really liked it. Um, orange juice, apple juice. If you um, really want to impress them, I don't know if you want to do this for the first meeting because you're setting precedence and they might come to expect it, mm -hmm. but um, you can do a hot breakfast. Um, we do that at our annual action plan meeting. So we, once a year, our advisory board helps us establish our goals for the rest of the year, and we actually do a hot breakfast for them. So we order out to the egg and I, and usually the egg and I, usually have to give them a day's notice, and they'll give you pancakes and sausage and bacon and whatever else you order. So that's going to be a good thing for that. If it's going to be a long meeting, do a hot breakfast. If you want to do that for the first meeting, up to you. 
I don't recommend it because they will expect a hot breakfast every time and budget kind of gets kind of funny after that. But um, have your MOU ready and in their folder that day. I prepare a folder for our advisory board every meeting and it's with all the documents we're going to talk about. The agenda, all the supporting documents. I actually gave you a copy of the MOU in that packet. Feel free to use that if you want to. But the MOU should be ready that day. Some of the, most of them are going to sign it that day. Others of them are going to have to take it home and think about it. If you have a representative there, they, they probably aren't going to sign it. They're going to say, I have to take this back to the office. But, you know, I can scan it to you or fax it to you. Um, you want to give them a tour of your school. You want to have some sort of presentation about your school. Um, that's usually the quickest way to get information out. Of course, as teachers, you probably shouldn't do a presentation all the time. But when you're dealing with business officials, you, you, you have to get it out really quickly. Typically, um, this thing doesn't last more than an hour, 9 to 10, 15. And it's because they can commit an hour. If you tell them that they're going to be there for two hours, they're like, mm. But try to make it an hour or less. Tours, presentations. In terms of your school commitment, all of your administrators should be present. This is top priority. There is nothing worse than asking business officials to come out and support your school and they're leaving work to support your school and your administrators are on campus and can't manage to come downstairs to the meeting. That does not look good. Everybody has to be there. Everybody has to introduce themselves. Let them know they are important and you all want them there. That's the way that this has to work. Here's an MOU example. I gave you guys a copy of this. Um, I showed you just the top part of this, but in your MOU, tell them exactly what you want from them. What's your responsibility? What's their response? It's on the back page of the, yeah. Um, tell them exactly, it's on the back of the first page, but tell them exactly what you want from them. If you want them to give internships, tell them. If you want them to maintain a positive relationship with the students and the staff, tell them that. If you want them to assist with evening events, tell them that. Because when they sign up, if you're, if you're not as specific as possible, you're very vague, they kind of are like, okay, what's the catch? It's the same thing like when you guys read a contract, you're like, hmm, it sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? They're not going to sign it until you specifically tell them what it is you want. And what's your responsibilities? What are you going to do for them? So to, answer, to further answer your question, Jody, that's where you're going to establish that. We will support you at your events. When you have an event, let us know. We will bring students out there. Um, yeah. And you said that some of them will sign it right away. Mm -hmm. But when you tell them, because we had our first advisory board mm -hmm. meeting, and when I tell them that we would like to have like internships and capstone projects and such, it was like, let us think about it. And yeah. What, what, what was the responses on that? Um, actually, 90% of ours signed it right away. They didn't have a problem with it. The internships and the capstone projects. Basically, um, what I would say in your presentation, just explain what it is. Maybe they they have an idea of what you're expecting from them, and it's it may not be exactly what you want. So tell them exactly what you mean when you say internship. Will our our students will get transportation from us? What we want from you is just for you to allow them to shadow you or to work in your lab facility, but we'll make sure that, you know, there'll be an explanation. You tell us what you need from us, what the students need to be certified in before they get there. So just what they don't want is they don't want students to come there and they feel like they're fully responsible for the students. They want to know how are you training them beforehand. So maybe that might have been why they needed to think about it. The other aspect of it is maybe, um, and this happened with one of our advisory board members, she couldn't agree to do that unless she got her boss's permission. So that might have been the other thing that was going on is they can't agree. They have to get their boss's permission because there's a couple of legality issues with having students on campus. So if they need to think about it, that's fine. You can just, what I would do is afterwards follow up with them, call them and just say, hey, you know, um, have you had a chance to find out information about whether or not you can agree to be on the advisory board? Is there anything I can do to assist you? Do I need to call someone and explain what we're asking for from you? And yeah, so you're in terms of building an advisory board, if you're the person doing it, you are the liaison between them and the school. It may mean you're going up there to meet with their board or meet with their board of directors to talk about what it is you need before they can agree. So there's a couple of different reasons. If um, 
if none of those that I just, the examples I gave are the reason, ask them, is there a hold up? Is there a reason? Is there something I can help with? And they'll tell you exactly what it is they're hesitating about. So, any other questions about <clears throat> that? Okay. Now, you want to do your follow-up and plan your first meeting. I already talked about follow-up. If you, I'm assuming that you wouldn't have invited them to the meeting unless you wanted them to be an advisory board member. So as long as they sign it, I just go ahead and say congratulations. You are now a partner in education for Harmony School of Ingenuity. Our first meeting is going to be on Monday. Blah, blah, blah I usually do two to three weeks later. You don't want to have it too far in the future because, again, if you give them a chance to forget, they will forget. So two to three weeks in the future. Follow up with the individuals who agree. There are some people who don't agree. That's okay. Send them an email and state that, that they've been accepted. For individuals who did not agree, see if they would like to be involved in another way. Maybe you can't be on the advisory board, but hey, would you like to be part of our guest speaker bureau? Would you be able to provide guest speakers? We go over this in this particular unit. Do you think that you could do this? Can you provide us with supplies? Can you volunteer for us at events? So they may not have the time right now to be part of the advisory board, but you don't want to let them get away. Ask them, how would you be willing to assist us? And you guys can probably find something they'd be willing to do. Now, of course, if they say, you know, I can't do anything right now, okay, well, thank you for your time, maybe in the future. And then, you know, later in the future, call them back and ask them. Again. So don't let them get away. It's because you never know when they might become valuable to you. So, am I standing your way? Okay. And one thing to remember about the no's versus the yes guys, 1,000 no's, or say one yes is worth 1,000 no's. You're going to get some no's, but you're going to get some yeses too. When I'm picking my advisory board members, one thing I, I forgot to mention, you typically want to go for the, I typically go for the less well-known places. In our area, we have these big name hospitals. We have MD Anderson Cancer Center. We have Baylor College of Medicine. I actually don't tend to ask them because I feel that they have a lot of people already asking them. And they may not be as willing to commit time to dealing with a startup academy. I go for the places that are less well known. The little doctor's offices, the pediatrician's offices that are privately owned. They typically don't have anyone asking them. And so when it comes to saying yes, they are a lot more likely to come out and say yes. Because they want to be involved with schools, but they're typically not on the radar of schools. And so I would go for those people, the ones that most people don't even know about. With our, We have um, a veterinarian that sits on our advisory board. She was right down the street from us. And though she has some job shattering, she's actually never been asked to sit on the advisory board. So for her, it was like, yeah, why not? You know, I get kids to come down and help me. And, you know, and no one's ever asked me to do it. So, tip: You want to send out your agenda as soon as possible with a reminder at least one week in advance. I gave you guys a copy of our agenda and what it looks like. Um, you can feel free to use that format if you want to. Meetings should only last an hour to an hour and a half at most. Okay? Keep in mind that some of these people may be coming from far away. They may be coming from their homes. With Prairie View, they drive an hour to get to our meetings, so we don't want to keep them for that long. Um, have a sign-in sheet prepared. You always want to have a sign-in sheet ready so that you know who was at your advisory board meeting and tracking it. Part of your TSTEM requirement is they do want to be, when they come to visit, they do want to be able to look at your sign-in sheet and say, oh, who was here on this day? Who was here on that day? And it's better for you to have it than to not have it. So always have that sign-in sheet. And give them a copy of the TSTEM blueprint, first day. That was what we talked about the first day was we are a STEM school. That means we follow this T-STEM blueprint. I gave them homework. I don't know if that's a good idea or not a good idea, but I gave them homework. Um, and the homework was to read the T-STEM blueprint. Yeah, it's, you know, eh. but they did it. They did it. I'm so proud of them. They did it. All right, so first meeting agenda. Selecting your chair. You do want to select your advisory board chair there. You also want to give an advisory board description. You all have a copy of this document. Basically, I went into a little bit further detail about exactly what it is I wanted them to do. And on the back end of that document, you'll see all of our advisory board members listed, okay? Which MOU they signed. So this is, this is a little bit more of a complete version of exactly what we expected them to do. Um,
Any questions thus far about this? So all of our members saw this document. Also, it was kind of like a proofreading. It's like, let me know now if I misspelled your name. So they kind of let me know, hey, this is not my how my name is spelled or anything like that. <coughs> Who should be present? Again, principal should be present for your first meeting. Your assistant principal should be present. Your counselors, your PR person, director of special programs, maybe. It depends on what where your school is headed. I'm an administrator. I'm the director of the Biomedical Sciences Academy. So because that's the direction we're going, I should be present for that. Um, your superintendent should really, will probably really only come for your annual action plan meeting. However, if you want him there for the first meeting, it's nice to have him, uh, have them meet who he is. For our first meeting, we didn't get the superintendent. We got his assistant, which was good enough. We got his <laughs> assistant. And just like we talked about with the office manager controlling everything, the assistant is the key to the superintendent. So if you can get the assistant to the superintendent, you're good. You always take minutes, always. Because usually when I take minutes, I I'm, I like very organized things, so mine tend to show up in a table. Some of yours are gonna do it differently, but you know, that's just me. You send out the advice, you send out the meetings uh, after the advisory board meeting is over. I send it out immediately after it's over, whether the people were present there or not. And then I send it out again a week before the next meeting. So the meetings from minutes from last meeting are present. And now this is the agenda for the next meeting. So I send out both about a week before our next meeting. For your next meeting, what I would suggest is um, you should create bylaws at this point. Because you're the liaison between the school, typically a few days before the meeting, or actually about two weeks before your meeting, before you come up with your agenda, you're actually going to have to meet with the advisory board chair and the um, advisory board vice chair, I guess, to come up with the agenda. Your bylaws govern how your advisory board works, and it also helps you address any foreseeable issues. I believe I gave you all a copy of the bylaws that we have. Feel free to use that format. It's a pretty standard bylaw. Basically, we talk about how many members have to be present in order for us to conduct a meeting, and we establish that together. We talk about how meetings will run, how we make decisions. We talk about what happens if a member is not active. The other members do have the, the ability to vote that member out. And if a member is voted out, then we ask that member to help us find a new member before they resign from that chair. So your bylaws are going to govern everything about it. And it's also the key to keeping your uh, advisory board invested. You don't want to just tell your advisory board things. You want to have them involved in as many decision-making abilities as possible. Because I set our advisory board up to function as an independent working body. I'm there, but I'm a kind of an ex officio member. I don't vote. I'm there to provide information, but they operate separate from the school. They have their own budget. They do their own fundraising. I'm there as a school liaison, and our principal and assistant principals are there, but they operate separately. That's going to be key. You don't typically, in terms of keeping the advisory board invested, a lot of times it's difficult for schools to let a, another stakeholder come in and make decisions, but the school has an accountability to the community. You're raising future citizens for the community, and your advisory board represents the community. So you do have to allow that advisory board to come in and make decisions. That's how you keep them invested. Let them know we are listening to what you say. You can't tell your advisory board your job is to advise and nothing else. Because then they're like, well, why am I here? I can go back to my job where my job is to run the building, you know, and not just advise. So whatever suggestions they make, make sure that they feel represented and make sure that there's follow-up on it. it. You can't just say, okay, yeah, that's great that you just gave us an hour and a half of suggestions. We're still, we're still going to do what we want to do, but thank you anyway. They have to feel that what they're saying is important. Yeah. So the way that you describe your advisory board, it's kind of like a PTO or a booster club that does fundraising and stuff like that. They do that as well, but they're a little bit more than a PTO or, or a booster club because they actually get behind the scenes of how we're doing stuff. If you went to my presentation yesterday, everything with that Biomedical Sciences Academy, I don't make those decisions alone. Before I put anything into action, 
I run it past them. What do you think about this? Should we be doing this? What classes should we offer next year? If the decision is controlled, with, is invested within me, it goes to them because their opinion is important to me. They represent the community. They represent where I'm trying my, for where I want my students to be. And that's where selecting those advisory board members is going to be important. If they represent where you want your students to be, you can't ignore what they say mm -hmm. because they know better you know, than anybody. My, my question was like, especially in the financial <coughs> part, when it comes to the legality, mm -hmm. do they have to go through the IRS and, or do they use the school's 501c3? Um, in most cases, they, um, it kind of depends. It kind of depends on how much of a fundraising we're talking about. We're actually going to have our first major fundraiser this summer, so that issue hasn't come up yet. But um, in general, it's always good to have a notary public on your advisory board because they would handle that aspect of it. Typically, because our advisory board is separate from us, we have them do their own. So they have their banking accounts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We have them do their own stuff. Um, and it's because the school can pay for certain things, but other things the advisory board will pay for, and so we don't want to combine budgets at all. They have their own stuff. So. Um, and that's another thing. In terms of who you're recruiting, you want a notary public. Find someone with a notary public on your advisory board. Because if they're doing fundraising, they need that. For your bylaws, as I said, it helps to address foreseeable issues with the advisory board. It sets your guidelines. It talks about how you how you operate. It talks about what my role is. Talks about what their role is. That's going to be probably one of the most important documents that you'll come up with. So, what are some foreseeable issues? I know everyone had this question, right? What are some issues that come with this? The time commitment changes. Someone takes on a new position, they can no longer. Um, make the time commitment to be your advisory board. So what do you do? That's where your bylaws come into play. Your bylaws should lay out that procedure. What happens when this person is not able to make this time commitment? How many meetings can this person miss before we say, okay, you need to go to the board? Is it the school's liaison's job to contact that person or is that the advisory board's chair's job to contact that person? Those are things that have to be discussed in your bylaws. School members are not as invested. Um, this one is a hard one. This one is a hard one. It's, um, and I'm not exactly sure that I even have a definite answer to that one. What I would say is that you just kind of have to keep pushing forward and letting your school know that it's important for them to show up. Um, I have no problem, you know, being like the little mosquito in people's ear. So as many times as I need to say it, you know, I would corner you in your office and hey, we have an advisory board meeting. Hey, we have an advisory board meeting. Are you showing up? Are you showing up? Hey, are you showing up? Oh, you can't make it today. That's okay. We have another one next month. Are you going to be there for that? You know, so it's, you kind of have to do that. It's let them know their input is important, but also say, is there something you want to share with the advisory board? You're the dean of discipline. Is there something that's happening in terms of testing that you think they need to know? Is there an event that's happening that you want to get their input on? You really, yeah, you have to just keep going. <coughs> that's as far as I've gotten with this. Maybe some of you have other suggestions about how to keep school board members invested. Um, <clears throat> for absent advisory board members, that's where you're in your bylaws. You're going to talk about a quorum. How many of you need to be present for its work? Okay. If you have less than that amount present, then you may have to cancel that meeting, but just note in the email you sent out, we need, per our bylaws, we need this many members present at all times. Your advisory board does have the option to actually edit your bylaws at any point, so that's actually in the bylaws itself, they can change it. So maybe you only have five members who are consistently showing up. You need to, you know, vote some members out, but then you also need to adjust your bylaws to reflect that change as well. New elections, how often do you elect new board members? How often do they hold offices? That's all going to be in your bylaws. Um, for our members, they, they sign a two-year contract. They're with us for two years unless they choose to resign. And then when they resign, they have to help us find a new member to take over for them. Allowing the board members to be stakeholders. As I said, that's going to be crucial. You're asking these people to miss work. You have to make sure that they have a say in what's happening. Right? Because if they don't, you're not going to keep them invested. 
also in terms of keeping them invested, giving them presents is really nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. We give them presents with our school name logo on there. We send them out greeting cards around the holidays. It's just something to let them know, hey, we're thinking of you. We, we appreciate what you guys are doing for us. We give them gift cards periodically. This comes from the Biomedical Sciences Academy budget just because there are certain things you can pay for with the school budget and can't. But with the, with the HIBSA budget, we kind of have a, a little bit more free reign with that. But we thank our advisory board members for their contributions. When we did the white coat ceremony, for those of you who went to my presentation yesterday, our advisory board got white coats. They're honorary members. So we recognize them for everything that they do because they're crucial to our school. When it comes to organizing events, all of our connections come from them. When it comes to um, decorating the school or putting up, we actually just got a new um, electronic sign. Our PTO and our advisory board paid for that. So you have to recognize them for what they're doing. Um, don't let them feel like, oh, we're just doing this for nothing. Does anyone see any other foreseeable issues or questions you want to ask me about? It's okay if you can't think of any right now. All right. So what are your benefits? Um, your advisory board offers internships. They do for your students. A lot of the community service and job shadow hours that we got come from our advisory board. Um, our advisory board usually brings an entire office with them. So when we do community projects in our classes, our advisory board's doing that. Our advisory board also um, has volunteered to offer trainings for our teachers. We're trying to build a STEM culture on our campus. And a lot of the times the teachers are like, well, I'm an English teacher. If we're trying to be the district medical academy, what does it have to do with me? And the advisory board, because they represent the healthcare profession, say, yeah, we'll come in and we'll talk to them. We'll tell them how many times we use English. We use English skills in our daily work. So they know if we're preparing kids to be future healthcare professionals, this is why they need to know English and this is what they need to know. Um, our advisory board also comes in and assists our students with workshops. They teach, uh, we actually took a field trip to Prairie View where their librarian actually taught our students to uh, research using college databases. That came from our advisory board. Okay? So your advisory board can only be as effective as you allow them to be. If you allow them to be effective and you allow them more control over decision making, then they will benefit you a lot more. If you don't let them do anything except advise you, you're kind of limiting how beneficial they're going to be. They do fundraising for us. We uh, have our major fundraising event this summer where our advisory board is actually off um, bringing in healthcare professionals and we're going to talk about the program and what it does and raise money for the program. What we were initially trying to do was buy land next to our school so we could build a new wing, except they're selling the land for like a million dollars an acre, so that's not going to happen. But we're going to um, raise the money to assist students with work. I know, I don't know. But uh, raise money to assist students with um, summer programs, for attending summer programs, because the demographic we serve, not all of our students can afford it, but our advisory board wants to help. So they do that as well. Field trips, they do plan field trips for us and they pay for them too. Media and press, our advisory board brings out the media and the press to talk with our kids about things or whenever we have an event, they do that. And also your advisory board represents your community. We talked about this in terms of the school does have an accountability to the community. That's where you're, ra you're raising students to be part of that community. So you need the community's voice present within the school. When you talk about stakeholders, community is a very good stakeholder in the school. Okay, so I didn't get that time. Okay, mm -hmm. we have like seven minutes for questions. About yeah. the internship opportunities, uh -huh. uh, which grade level seems to be uh, you know, appropriate, or uh, what kind of internship activities? Okay. That have um, in terms of grade levels, we uh, typically only do high school. But for us, that's because we're transitioning to only becoming high school. Um, we do only high school because usually that's the only age that we trust them to be off campus by themselves um, because that's usually what happens. Um, middle schoolers, they can do internships, but I would say that you, you would do it in a group and there should always be a teacher present with that group at all times. I've never done it with middle school. If anyone has done it with middle school, you let me know how that works out. But usually we do high school in terms of transportation. 
Right now, um, our students and our parents are actually agreeing to transport them. In most cases, we pick places that are actually really close to our school, so the students just walk down together. Um, sometimes, when we actually when we send home the job shadowing or community service forms, we ask the parents, "How would you like your child to be transported? Can a teacher drop them off? Can the, in some cases, we've actually had a doctor that said that she wouldn't mind coming to get them." So we just have to ask the parents, can a doctor come and get your kid and, you know, make sure we deal with all the legalities of that. But um, you had a second question. It was about uh, what kind what of, kind of internships. Yeah. Um, research facilities. <clears throat> and also we, sorry, our students work in research facilities. They work with Type Air, which is um, a biotechnology research facility that's on our campus. So they don't have to be transported. They just walk to another wing of our school. We do have research facilities that are off campus, and in that case, the parents are transporting the kids. Um, we offer the vet job shadow and community service. The kids walk down to that one. We offer OBGYN. That one is actually right down, um, right around the block from us, so the parents drop the kids off, or in some cases, the parents have given me permission, and we deal with the legalities of it, and they give me permission to drop the kids off. So we, we're always building more opportunities. Are the internships during the school? or like Not this year. Next year they will be. This year they're after school. The reason why next year they will be during the school is because next year in our biomedical pathway, we are offering BI, which is the fourth year class of PLTW, and it requires an internship that usually happens during the class. So next year it will be. What we're doing right now is discussing with our district how that transportation is going to work. Um, typically, the students don't get to BI until they're seniors, so by that time, they usually have their own car, so the situation kind of works itself out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you gotten any um, feedback from the community about the transportation and how you guys are arranging for internships for kids to leave and uh, field trips for kids to leave and guest speakers for kids to leave, like pulling the kids out of class not usually, but here's what I do to assist with that. Um, I have the ability to actually track all of the kids' grades. And so generally, um, I don't allow a student to attend a field trip or a guest speaker if they're failing a class. And then before um, I go on the field trip, I send an email out with the student's name to all those teachers. And if there's any reason that this kid cannot miss your class, let me know. Um, the students have an understanding that they have to make up all their work and I actually have them have a send out a form with them that they have to track all of their work that they're missing and get it signed by the teacher that says it's okay if you make this up and this is when you need to make it up by. So there's a, a lot of paperwork involved with that, but um, we try not to plan we try to plan our events in the evening for that very reason. But if they do have to miss class, I usually plan it to where they're missing my class or they're missing a class that I know the teacher is okay with them leaving, or they're missing a class where they're passing, and so it's, they make up the world. So, being with this program, it's, we have high expectations for the kids. We don't, you're going to make up the world. So, or, you know, there'll be consequences where you'll be sitting after school in an hour's detention where you're going to make up the work anyway. So, you know, but, any other questions? You guys have been marvelous. I do have some cards here. If you guys have any questions about anything, um, please let me know. I'll be more than welcome to share with you what I uh, what I have. As you said, nothing here is final. We're still the advisory board is a dynamic process. It's never complete. So some of you are going to find some things that work. And please let's share.